Okay, uh, inshallah, we'll begin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, we'll continue. This is our 24th uh, lesson of the commentary of Mukhtasar al targhib al tarheeb by al Hafiz. Ibn Hajar, Ibn Hajar Rahimahullah. So we've reached, we're still in the book of uh, prayer and we've reached chapter 23. The author Rahimahullah, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, At-Tarheebu min ta'akhuri rijal an al-Sufuf al-Awwal. So this is a discouragement from, uh, for, from men uh, delaying in, in coming to the prayer and in occupying the Asufuf al awl in occupying the front rows. This hadith is narrated by Aisha radiallahu an, hadith 136. An Aisha radiallahu anha, qalat qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la yazalu qawmun yata'akharuna ani saf al awl hatta yu'akhirahum allahu fin nar. Rawahu Abu Dawud wa sahahu ibn Khuzayma wa ibn Hibban. On the fright of Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, people will continue in um, delaying, or, or, or delaying in, in occupying the front rows until Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will يُؤَخِّرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي النار, until Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will eventually make them uh, enter the hellfire. Um, this hadith is reported by Abu Dawood وصححه ابن خزيمة and it was authenticated by ابن خزينة and ابن حبان. Now, um, let's firstly understand that when it comes to hadith of uh, targhib and tarheeb, when it comes to hadith of encouraging people to do good deeds and discouraging them from committing certain deeds, um, Often you'll find uh, these hadith are what we will call in Arabic a statement of mubalagha. Um, they are a type of hyperbole which is used to uh, encourage people to do something although that encouragement might not be literally intended or the consequences might not be literally intended. So this perhaps is an example of that. It's not saying that if you don't pray in the front three rows, you will go to the hellfire. That would be wrong because then that would imply that praying in the front three, in the front row is an obligation because a person is only punishable if they commit a sin or if they don't fulfill an obligation. And no scholar in Islam has said that praying in the front row is an obligation, meaning if you don't do it, you will be sinful. Or that you'll be sinful if you pray in the second row or the third row or the last row. No one says you'll be sinful if you pray in the last row. So what does this mean? Well, firstly, um, there is another version of this hadith which is, uh, which is uh, we can say maybe more authentic, which is the hadith which is in Sahih Muslim. Now the version in Sahih Muslim mentions that um, it, it doesn't mention this last phrase here, حتى يؤخرهم الله في النار, which will basically therefore translate as a people will continue to um, de or delay in, in occupying the front rows, meaning they will continue to sort of يتأخرون, meaning they will pray in the last few rows until Allah will delay them. Uh, and that's it. It's, it ends there, according to the version of Sahih Muslim. And for many scholars, what that means is حَتَّى يُؤَخِّرُهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الْجَنَّةِ Meaning, until Allah delays them in entering into paradise. Which, many, in many ways, makes sense. In the sense that, if there are people who are so lackadaisical, they're very lazy, they're very laid back, they don't care about the front row. Meaning, that it's symbolic of, of their attitude to good deeds. That meaning, they have no sense of uh, musabaqa and musara'a they have no sense of competing with other people and doing good deeds or hastening to do good deeds people like that will end up you know not desiring the goodness of the afterlife that much okay 
And because of their lazy attitude, they won't end up doing many good deeds. If they don't end up doing many good deeds, then it's likely that they will um, they won't be from the forerunners. They won't be from those who will race to paradise. Right? They will eventually slowly enter into paradise. Okay, so that's what the hadith is trying to teach us. That's according to that understanding. Now, um, yes, according to this version of the hadith, which is in, reported by Abu Dawood, some scholars did speak about this additional statement here until Allah ends up making them go to the hellfire. That's not to say that praying in the front rows is an obligation, but it's saying that if people become so negligent about good deeds, then they will end up maybe not fulfilling their obligations. And if they're not you know, uh, fulfilling their obligations, they will um, start committing sins. And if they start committing sins and start abandoning good deeds, then of course this will, will it will lead to people going to um, the hellfire. Right, so um, that's something that you know is a key message uh, from this hadith. Right, so the, a person's eagerness to pray in the front rows is an is is an indication of how eager they are to to earn reward and to be closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And we we did mention last week that I think one of the reasons why you know praying in the front rows it is such a virtuous thing because it does reflect again a person's eagerness to do goodness and hastening to do goodness but it's also that they're closer to the imam right and that therefore they can um you know listen to the quran more attentively and as opposed to someone who's far away and can barely hear anything now yes one could argue in this day and age you know you can hear the imam probably better in the final row because you're sitting standing right next to the speaker for example but that's not just that it's, it's not just a matter of being able to listen to the imam more attentively but it's a sign of eagerness of of, uh, of, uh, of of desiring to uh, to hasten to do good deeds right? I, I've you know as, as Musa said I've hastened to to come to my Lord so that you'll be pleased with me um, so uh, you know the act of Musa with the attitude of hastening to do good deeds is it's important Allahu alam um, could this refer to question here? Could this refer to a certain people, as in the Munafiqun? I haven't seen that being stated uh, by by anyone. But if you mean th this particular wording, right? Um, that a group of people will continue in 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 in, um, in forsaking the front rows until Allah will enter them into the hellfire. Um, Potentially, I mean, I, I think like that, that that could have been the case, but it's equally applicable to 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 anybody else, right? That um, we should not delay in in doing good deeds because otherwise that will mean we will end up neglecting our good deeds. If we neglect our good deeds, um, then uh, uh, then that we are at risk of of of, of falling into sin. So. The attitude of musara'a, the attitude of uh, hastening to do good deeds, it, it creates a buffer zone, right, between you and sin. Okay, whereas if you become very, again, lackadaisical and and and, and negligent to 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 uh, um, to hastening to do good deeds, then you are at risk of not doing good deeds at all, right? And if you're at risk of not doing any good deeds, then the next thing for you is really falling into sin and questionable actions. So that should be another thing, you know, another thing you can add to your mindset. Yeah, what your mindset of 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 reasons for do, you know hastening to do good deeds to protect yourself from sin. Yeah, to protect yourself from from sin. Wallahu a'lam. Okay. Um, all right, moving on to the, the that was only one hadith in, in that chapter. So chapter uh, twenty four now. Um, so in this chapter, we look at the encouragement to to make the ta'min to say the amin behind uh, the imam, and um, uh, and dua and um, the dua of iftitah as well, beginning of the prayer and uh, being moderate in that as we will see so the first hadith in the chapter hadith 
عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عن أن النبي صلى الله أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إذا قال الإمام غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين فقولوا آمين فإنه من وافق قوله قول الملائكة غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه متفق عليه واللفظ للبخاري وله إذا قال أحدكم آمين وقالت الملائكة في السماء آمين فوافقت إحداهما الأخرى غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه So on the authority of Abu Huraira, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, is, when the Imam says, غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين فقولوا آمين then say آمين say آمين فإنه من وافق قوله قول الملائكة because Whoever's statement of Amin, saying of Amin, coincides with the Amin of the Malaika, it coincides with the Amin of the angels, then his previous sins will be forgiven. And this is reported by Bukhari, and the wording is for Bukh- uh, sorry, this is agreed upon, and this is the wording of Bukhari. And also, there's another version that says if one of you says Amin, and the angels say in the, and the angels in the heavens say Amin. فوافقت إحداهما الأخرى and they coincide at the same time then the person's previous sins will be forgiven and yeah subhanallah I guess this is really a very important reminder including to myself that this is a really subhanallah significant part of the prayer because as you know Surah Al-Fatiha is a dua Surah Al-Fatiha is a supplication. You are asking Allah, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim, Guide us to the straight path. Right? Guide us to the straight path. So everything you've said, really, up until that, is a build-up to that supplication. You, 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 The beginning part of Al-Fatiha is praising Allah. Then you make tawassul to Allah through your ibadah by saying, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Right, so you're doing all of those things to make it more likely for your du'a to be answered. So you're saying, "Ihdina sirat al mustaqim," guide us to the straight path. And then you ask Allah, "Ghayr, you know, sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim, ghayr al maghdubi alayhim, wal dalin." The path of those whom you have favored, not those who have earned your wrath or have gone astray. And then you say, "Amin." And "Amin," the meaning of "Amin," what does "Amin" mean? It actually means "Allah mustajib," which actually means, "Oh Allah." Respond. Okay. Oh Allah, respond to the um, to the supplication. So uh, it, it's a noun, but has a meaning of a verb, right? It has the meaning of Oh Allah, Allahumma istajib. Oh Allah, please, you know, we beg you to respond. Um, so it's a significant statement. It's a reply to a dua. But the significance of it coinciding with the angels, I mean, that's wonderful. To, to know that the angels, they are listening to your supplication and they also say Amin as well. And that adds something to your prayer, if you think about it, right? That um, the angels are participating in your Salah or are, are, particip- are participating in the prayer. So that again adds more value to the, to the prayer itself. To it coincide with the Amin of the angels means that the person is therefore very attentive, right? It's not he's that his mind wanders off and you end up saying Amin after a long time because you forgot that the Imam said Amin. You're saying it as soon as the Imam finishes his recitation. Okay? As soon as he finishes his recitation and he says Amin and you say Amin coincides with his with the Amin of the angels, then your previous sins will be forgiven. Um, now, uh, okay, yeah, I was expecting someone to ask a question <laughs> relating to this. Um, does does this coinciding of Amin mean raising the voice as loud as possible or prolonging it or just saying it? Ahnaf seem not to raise their voice when saying it. Um Another comment as well, subhanAllah, some masajid are dead silent when it comes to the ta'min. Is it not recommended in some madahib? Okay. Saying ameen is a different mas'ala to saying it loudly. That's the first point. Right? So, the Hanafis are fully aware of this hadith. And in their understanding, they are implementing it fine. Because they say ameen as well. But they say it quietly. 
The idea is that it coincides with the Amin of the angels. Now, yes, there is evidence to say that it should be recited loudly, right? There is evidence for that as well. Um, so how do we, you know, what, you know, so, so, so just to be clear, right? It's it's not that, um, I mean, in fact, these hadith or the, the versions of this hadith, right, seem don't indicate it saying it loud. Although there is another version, or Abu Dawood, that 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 says that says that it should be recited out aloud. Um, to answer this, okay, I came fully prepared, <laughs> so I have with me here, right, Ya'la Sunan, which is um, you know a twenty-five volume book on the evidences of the Hanafi school of thought, right. So this is by uh, Muhammad Taqi Uthmani. Right, and it, it goes through all of the evidences of um, particularly hadith wise of the positions of the Hanafis. So I know I knew people would be interested in this. I thought, I thought, let me just you know uh, give some perspective as to you know how they understand these issues, right? So that we become more educated, right? And not just become, oh, look, they're not following the Sunnah, right? So, firstly. Um, the first point, right, when it comes to uh, these hadith, right, these hadith, um, uh, this version of the hadith doesn't actually mention uh, saying it aloud. What it says is that if your amin coincides with the amin of the angels, right, and uh, saying amin is a part of your dua, right, and as you know from the dua anyway, from the sunnah of a dua, is that you don't raise your voice. Right, you like. You, uh, by the way, I follow the view that you recite it loudly. You say "Amin" loudly. <laughs> yeah. So just, I'm trying to make you understand their position. The default is that when it comes to du'a, etc., is that you don't, you know, um, uh, raise your voice and, and and say it very, very loudly. As the Prophet Sallam said, you're not calling upon someone who's deaf, right? So you know that's one issue. Um. The the second issue here is that um, uh, in another version, uh, and, and here this is hadith reported by um, uh, um, just find the narration here. Um, yes, Ibrahim al Nakhai, who was a Tabi'i, Ibrahim al Nakhai, who is uh, a Tabi'i, he said the following Khamsun Tukhfina Hunna al Imam. There are five statements that the Imam uh, should recite quietly. And Ibrahim al Nakhai is a Tabi'i, right? a great Tabi'i. tabi'i. He said there are five things that are recited quietly. For the Imam to say Subhanaka Allah wa Hamdika wa Tabaraka Smuka wa Ta'ala Jadduka wa La ilaha Ghayruka. The dua of Istiftah. Secondly, at Ta'awudh. Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Thirdly, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Fourthly, wa Amin. Amin. And fifthly, Rabbana Laka Alhamd. And the Imam, he says, Sami'a Allah liman Hamida. Okay, Rabbana Lak Alhamd is recited quietly. This is reported by Abdul Razak in the Musannaf of Abdul Razak and in other collections as well. And, um, you know, Ibrahim al Nakhai, right, was a Tabi'i. Now, the statement of a Tabi'i is not a Hujjah, is not a proof according to the majority. Okay, but for the Hanafis, a statement of a Tabi'i can be. A source of of it can be a dalil as long as it does not oppose any marfu' tradition it doesn't oppose any uh, contradict another you know connected uh, hadith um then the argument would be what but there are hadith right that mention that the you know uh, the prophet recited out aloud and the companions recited out aloud 
But then the, the response to that is that this was done for ta'leem. That the, 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 that the Prophet would say Amin loudly so that the companions would say Amin as well to teach them, right? And there were many times, you know, how, how did the Prophet ﷺ, um, uh, recite or how, how did the Prophet ﷺ teach the companions in prayer? He would stand in prayer and he would recite a lot of the things out aloud. Right, to the extent that there are so many reports like Salatul Janazah, right? Some people have taken it so far that I've seen some of the you know the people from the Ahlul Hadith movement, when it comes to Salatul Janazah, they recited everything out aloud. Right? That's because you know they're taking those traditions in which um the Prophet was teaching their companions how to say it out aloud. Uh, so how, you know how what to recite during the prayer. Okay. And likewise there are there are statements of, of, of a number of companions as well. Um, um, uh, and here there's another narration that he brings which is uh, uh, reported in Dara Qutni in the Musa of Imam Ahmad um, and this is reported by Al-Hasan from the authority of uh, Samara ibn Jundub radiyallahu an. he said كان إذا صلى بنا كان إذا صلى بهم سكت سكتتين إذا افتتح الصلاة وإذا قال ولا الضالين سكت أيضا هنيئة فأنكروا ذلك عليه فكتب إلى أبي بن كعب فكتب إليهم أبي أن الأمر كما صنع سمرة. So some of the companions would 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 pause. They would make a pause, right, before starting the prayer, and then after ولا الضالين and they would pause. And some people would oppose them in that. And so they wrote to Ubay ibn Ka'ab, who was another companion, um, and that um, essentially saying that that was, that was fine. Right? The fact that he kept silent after Allah Dalin didn't say anything, then that's fine. Um, uh, also, uh, in another narration, it says, كان, على, uh, كان علي وعبد الله, يعني علي رضي الله عنه, and Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, they wouldn't say the basmala loudly, nor would they say the, the ta'weed, a'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim, loudly, nor would they say the amin loudly. And this is reported by At-Tabarani. And they have other narrations, like Umar ibn Khattab, right? He wouldn't recite the, the amin loudly. And that was reported by Ibn Jirid al-Tabari in Tahdeeb al-Athar. And, you know, and there's just tons, there's tons of information here, right? So, at the, you know, at the least, this is an issue of khilaf. The Sahaba differed over it. Right, the Sahaba clearly differed over this issue, and those narrations that mention that the the Sahaba would recite it loudly, yes, that they're authentic, yeah, and this is the view of those who say that you recite it loudly, and that's fine. Let's not turn it into a big issue, right? The Salaf, many of them in the past, if they would enter into a mosque and they didn't recite out aloud, uh, they would respect that. They would respect that and not recite it out aloud as well. That doesn't mean you're opposing this hadith, because the idea is to say Amin, and you can say Amin quietly, if it coincides with the Amin of the angels. It doesn't mean that you have to blast it out aloud and, and think, you know, so it coincides with the Malaika. It can still coincide with the Malaika if you say it quietly. So these are two separate issues. The one issue of saying Amin and co making it coincide with the Imam, you could do that even quietly. And then there's another issue which is reciting out aloud, saying Amin loudly. Yeah? So they're two separate issues that shouldn't be conflated. So, um, as for uh, prolonging it, saying Amin, okay, here the, be aware of two mistakes that people make. Number one is, 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 uh, is saying Amin, putting a Shadda on the meme. Don't put a shadda on the meme. So it's not well um, mean no, that changes the meaning. Amina wala amin al bayt means to um uh, to uh, to intend qasidin. It means to intend a place. Right? Which is which yeah, so it's amin. Now some people to avoid that mistake, they go to the other extreme and they say amin. Right? So it is slightly extended, I mean, that's fine. Okay, but not I mean, or I mean, and 
That's one extreme. The other extreme is to, to say so long that you put a shadda on the meme. I mean, then that's not uh, appropriate as well. Okay. Right. So hopefully that covers that. Um, let's move on to the next hadith, inshallah. Um, hadith 138 عن حبيب ابن عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول لا يجتمع ملأ فيدعو بعضهم ويؤمن بعضهم إلا أجابهم الله رواه الحاكم On the authority of, of Habib ibn Salama reported uh, he mentioned that and uh, رضي الله عن Habib ibn Salama was a sahabi and he was someone who was mujab al da'wah, meaning he was someone whose du'as would be responded to. He said, I heard the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, No la yajtami'u mala'un, no group of people come together, fayadu ba'duhum wa yu'aminu ba'duhum. Um and you know, no group of people come together where one of them makes a du'a wa yu'aminu ba'duhum and, and, and some of them say Ameen. None except that Allah will respond to them. This doesn't happen except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to them. And this is reported by Al Hakim, right? The Mustadraq of Al Hakim. This hadith is, um, uh, some scholars did consider it to be weak, a weak hadith, right? But the meaning does, no one differs with the meaning. Meaning, if there are, if there are a group of people, like we're a group, right? Although we're in space wise, we're, we're in different places, right? You know, but if I said, you know, may Allah guide us all, may Allah grant us all tawfiq, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all jannah. And you all said, ameen, 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 right? As a group coming together and they're making dua, a person saying, making a dua, and other people saying, ameen, right? This is uh, absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that. And and inshallah, it's a reason for, you know, a collective supplication, you know, strengthens the, 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 the uh, it strengthens it. Right, more people saying Amin, especially the more sincere people say Amin, then the more likely it is to be responded to. Okay, here is a question. Okay, what about raising your hands? Right, what about if you know we were just sitting and I said, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Jannah, and you know, I raise my hands, for example. Um, and other people raise their hands as well, all right? Now, I'm sure a lot of you would, would think, mm, this is not really from the Sunnah, all right? This is not really from the Sunnah to do that. Um, here, okay, if it's a dua that a person says, right, a spontaneous dua, not, we're, we're not saying that this is like a fixed dua at a fixed time, in a fixed place or anything like that, just a spontaneous dua, Right, um, you know, for example, you know, uh, we accomplish something really great, and uh, we want Allah to accept it. For example, okay, and we just, you know, person raised their hands, okay, made dua. I personally don't see this um, as a problem, okay, because from the Sunnah of dua is that you raise your hands. Okay, from the sunnah of dua is that you raise your hands. Okay, if you're making a dua, what's the sunnah? It's to raise your hands. Okay, um, and so if other people were to do it, I wouldn't see it as a as an issue. I don't think it's worth it. it, it you know, it it one should make inkar of it, right? Um, you, you know, I mean, I I think we, many of us would have had a view otherwise. I I used to tell people <laughs> it's wrong to do that in the past as well. Right, but purely from um, from a shari perspective and from from a general perspective, okay, that we know from the general principles is that from the etiquette of du'a is that you raise your hands. If a person chose not to do it, that's fine. But if a person chose to do it and to said amin, right, um, I don't see why it would be a, considered to be munkar, why it would be considered to be evil or an innovation, 
okay, because a person is just following the etiquettes of an established sunnah. And the etiquettes of a sunnah is that when a person makes dua, uh, they raise their hands, right? So, wallahu alam. Wiping your hands after wiping your face after the dua that's uh, has clear evidence behind it. Uh, the only issue here is the scholars differ over the authenticity of it. You know, they're about this has been reported from about thirteen companions, right? That they would raise wipe their faces after making dua, right? About thirteen companions narrated this, and uh, ma majority of scholars consider it a sunnah, right? Ibn Hajar considered the hadith to be authentic; that they will give strength to one another. Right, there are some scholars who don't think that the, ever, that the hadith gives strength to one another. Uh, they don't support one another, but the matter is 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 quite flexible. Right, even Sheikh bin Uthameen, rahimahullah, he said it's flexible. If a person chooses to do it, that's fine. Right, because many great scholars of Islam consider it to be a sunnah, and uh, there are numerous reports. Okay, so if a person wants to do it, it's okay. Inshallah, there should be no inkar of it. Now, for khutbah is slightly different, right? For the khutbah on Eid, or during the khutbah when the Imam concludes while making a dua, should one raise their hands and say Amin, or does it take away from the reward of the khutbah as per other hadith? Many of the Salaf were very stern against this practice of raising their hands during the khutbah, right? And uh, and they would say very harsh things to people who would raise their hands during the khutbah. Because that wasn't uh, ever reported from the Prophet ﷺ or the companions that at that particular moment they would raise their hands. Right? And there are strong statements of the Tabi'in about, you know, they let their hands be cut off, those who raise their hands during the, the khutbah. Right? So, again, quite a exaggerated statement, but just to tell people, look, this, is, this wasn't, the companions didn't do this. Okay, but that's as I said, it's different to. Um, them being like a sudden spontaneous dua and people want to say amin to it and if they wanted to raise their hands I don't see it as a uh, an, an issue Allahu alam okay um, the next hadith 139 وعن ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما قال بينما نحن نصلي مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذ قال رجل من القوم الله أكبر كبيرا والحمد لله كثيرا وسبحان الله بكرة وأصيلا فقال رسول فقال له فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من القائل كلمة كذا وكذا فقال رجل من القوم أنا يا رسول الله قال عجبت لها فتحت لها أبواب السماء قال ابن عمر فما تركتهن منذ سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ذلك رواه مسلم so in the fight of Ibn Umar he said um, that whilst we were praying with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi one day, um, then a man from amongst the people, he, he said, Allahu Akbar wa kabira wa alhamdulillahi kathira wa subhanallahi bukratan wa asila. So Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar kabira, like in intensifying the takbir. And all praise is due to Allah in plentitude. Wa subhanallahi bukratan wa asila. And glory be to Allah in the mornings and the evenings. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, who is this statement? Who said this? Who said this expression? Who said this? Allahu Akbar kabira wa alhamdulillah kathira wa subhanallah bukratan wa asila. And the man he said, I said it, O Messenger of Allah. He said, I was amazed by it. Ajibtu laha. Like I've been, I was amazed by it. For the gates of the heavens opened up as a result. So the gates of the heavens, they opened up because to indicate that the angels were to write it down. Um, and Ibn Umar, he said that I never stopped saying it after I heard the Messenger وسلم, say that. And it's reported by uh, Sahih Muslim. This is reported by Sahih Muslim. Um, so this is the, uh, you know, where does this fit in with this uh, chapter? This is the, a, a, um, a dua that could be said dua of iftitah. As you know, there are many supplications that a person can can say when starting off the prayer. Uh, the standard one, which most people know, is Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayruka. And there are many others. The Prophet used to say, like when you wake up in the night prayers, Allahumma rabbi jibreel wa mikail wa israfil fatir as-samawati wal ard alim al-ghaybi wa shahada anta tahkum bayna ibadaka fi makanu fi yakhtalifun, etc. Um, 
so so this man he started off the prayer in that fashion Allahu akbaru kabira walhamdulillahi kathira wa subhanallahi bukratan wa asila so this is one this is another dua of istiftah that a person can say um and and, and notice that, you know it, it's as if this man sort of came about came about with this dhikr himself right uh, and the Prophet ﷺ came to learn of it. And this is a number of occasions like this. And this is obviously during the time when prayer was being revealed and people were learning about the Salah. Um, perhaps people didn't have the attitude that we have to it today because now everything's fixed, right? Um, we know how when it comes to legislation, you know, we have to follow in the, the, the specific model of the Prophet ﷺ that he set for us. Uh, the companions were first learning right that you know when it comes to all the intricacies of following the sunnah and um, saying the specific things required during the prayer you know it was an, at an early stage for many of the companions and so maybe they sort of varied the things that they would say and they would adjust a few things here and there okay but they learned the more they learned the more um you know that obviously they would have adhered to the uh, um uh, the, the you know the specific things that the Prophet ﷺ would say, but either way, this was retained, uh, and the Ibn Umar he used to say it frequently. Uh, the next hadith, um, عن رفاعة ابن رافع الزرقي رضي الله عنه قال كنا نصلي وراء نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فلما رفع رأسه من الركعة قال سمع الله لمن حمده قال رجل من ورائه ربنا وكل ولك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه فلما انصرف قال من المتكلم قال أنا قال رأيت بضعة وثلاثين ملكا يبتدرونها أيهم يكتبها الأول رواه مالك والبخاري وأبو داود والنسائي So in the authority of um, Rifa' ibn Rafi' al-Zuraqi he said we were praying with the mess- behind the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when, when he rised from ruku' he said سمع الله لمن حمد and a man he from behind he said رَبَّنَا وَلَكَ الْحَمْدِ حَمْدًا كَثِيرًا طَيِّبًا مُبَارَكًا فِيهِ So all praise, O oh Allah, to you belongs all praise, a good, pure and blessed praise. And when the fin- prayer finished, the Prophet ﷺ said, Who said that during the prayer? And the man said, I did. He said, I saw 30-odd companions racing with one another, who amongst them would write it down first? Because it was such a beautiful expression. It was such a beautiful expression. And so... This is a, a recommended thing that you'll find that you'll find in books of fiqh and hadith that encourage people to say this. This is an additional thing that you can say. Obviously, Rabbana lak alhamd, it's a must. Um, but to add to that is good. Hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi mil'a. There's even more. Mil'a samawati wa mil'a al-ard. Wa mil'a ma shi'ta min shay'in ba'du. Etc. So there are other additional things that you can say. You'll find it in the Hisn al-Muslim book. And um, uh, the next hadith, 141, وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إذا قال الإمام سمع الله لمن حمد فقول اللهم ربنا لك الحمد فإنه من وافق قوله قول الملائكة غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه متفق عليه وفي روات للبخاري ومسلم ولك الحمد بالواو uh, and this is an interesting hadith, by the way, because it, it proves the previous point that we mentioned earlier on. This hadith reported by Abu Huraira, the Messenger of uh, said, When the Imam says, Sami Allahu liman hamida, then say, Allahumma rabbana lakal hamd. And you can say, Allahumma rabbana wa lakal hamd. It's flexible. Whoever says this and his statement coincides with the statement of the angels, meaning the angels, they say it as well then his previous sins will be forgiven. Now, why is that interesting? Because we don't say loudly, Rabbana lak alhamd, with the imam. It's something we say quietly to ourselves. Right? We say it quietly to ourselves. We don't say, Rabbana wa lak alhamd in, in jama'ah, in congregation together. So this is similar to the same wording that with regards to the Amin. If your Amin coincides with the Amin of the angels, your previous sins are forgiven. The same statement here. You are saying Rabbana lak alhamd, Allahumma Rabbana wa lak alhamd. Is it co- if it coincides with the statement of the angels, your previous sins will be forgiven. And we all agree that we don't say this loudly. Yeah. So this is a you know to indicate that they're two separate issues. It coinciding with the angels and saying it loudly. 
So we shouldn't conflate between the two issues. Right. Um, let's uh, move on, inshallah. And let's just take this final chapter. There's only one hadith, one major hadith. Uh, so chapter 25 At-Tarheebu min rafi' al-limamum ra'sahu qabla al-imam min al-ruku'i wa sujud Warning this is a hadith inc includes a warning not to raise your head before the imam in uh, ruku' and sujud Okay so the the person should leave a slight gap between himself and the imam when rising and going into ruku' in in all of the you know movements within the prayer uh, hadith 142 Wa Abi Huraira Radiallahu Anhu and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sallallahu وصحوا بن حبان بلفظ أما يخشى وللبزار والطبراني بلفظ الذي يخفض ويرفع قبل الإمام إنما ناصيته بيد الشيطان وإسناده حسن ووافقه مالك. So in the fight of Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Do one of you not fear that if you are to raise raise his head from ruku or from sujud before the Imam? That Allah will make his head like the head of a donkey or Allah make his image or his physical form like the form of a donkey and this is reported by Bukhari and Muslim now what is the issue here when going into Rukur or Sujood right raising your head before the Imam why is this considered to be such a major thing to the extent that if you do it significantly, you've you've and done it intentionally, you've nullified your prayer. This is because when praying, we have to pray together as a congregation, as a single unit. If one was allowed to proceed, the Imam will go before or a long time after, etc., then it will no longer really the prayer won't be done in unison. Okay, it won't be done in unison. It will um, look as though people are praying by themselves. And as you know, we spoke about last week, the Prophet was very concerned about the, 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 the surah of the prayer, how it looked, to the extent that if a person had their chest just, you know, sticking out a bit more than somebody else in the row, he would, he would push that person back. Right? Everyone should be equal in prayer. So it's not just in the in, in in the way we stand, but in movements as well. Okay. And and here is an interesting point, right? Here is an interesting point that Imam Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah made, right? He said, with regards to the Jilsatul Istiraha, you that you find some people doing, you know, before they come out from sujood, they sit and rest, and then they stand up. Okay, this is known as the Jilsa of Istiraha. According to majority of scholars, right, just as a side point, this wasn't intended in and of itself. The Prophet ﷺ only started to do this because um, he uh, um, his knees became weak and so he found it difficult to get up from sujood straight away. Right? But anyway, the point was that Ibn Taymiyyah said that if the Imam doesn't do Jilsa to Istiraha, then the Ma'mumin shouldn't do Jalsa to Istiraha, the Jilsa. Not that they shouldn't, but it's not advised. Why? Because that will lead to a delay in people following the Imam. Right? So if the man stand, stands up straight away and people sit down for like a, you know, half a second and then they stand up, right? They're delaying it. Right? So the idea is that we should follow the Imam closely. Not do anything before and not do anything um, um, not do anything before, nor should they, sorry, they shouldn't go into, you know, precede the Imam, nor should they delay significantly. Like sometimes you find people, they spend a long time in sujood when the Imam came up, and it's like, you know, they shouldn't be doing that, right? They should be, إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِمَامِ لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ The Imam was made for, for him to be followed. So you shouldn't follow the Imam uh, you shouldn't delay in following the Imam. If anything, leave a slight gap to prevent yourself from going before him. 
Sometimes you find people, they follow the Imam straight away. Right? No, leave a slight gap. Right? So, so that you don't end up going before the Imam. And that's to maintain um, uh, the, 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 the image of the prayer that is being done in a, as, a, as a single unit. And everyone is praying in unison together, which reflects the the ubudiya, the servitude of the, of the servants, that they, they are praying together as one unit. Now, the, the hadith says, you know, don't one of you fear that if you were to rise before the imam, that Allah will turn your head into the head of a donkey or make your image the image of a donkey. The, the, the owl here, you know, make your head of the head of a donkey or uh, your, your image like the image of a donkey. Um, that's not the wording of the Prophet, meaning this shak or this doubt is 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 from the rawi right it's from the narrator of the hadith so the narrator of the hadith is not sure did he say like the allah will make his head like the head of a donkey or his appearance like that of a donkey so there's doubt from the narrator of the hadith and then further to that the scholars discuss did the prophet sallam mention say this literally or figuratively meaning did he literally mean that you will you will look like a donkey your head would transform into a donkey or did it mean figuratively? Many scholars did say figuratively. Many scholars said literally. Literally, why? Because this is known as maskh. Uh, this happened in Bani Israel, where, where some of them were turned into uh, apes and 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 um, and, uh, and and swine. Um, and some say that this was a, a a warning to to people specifically at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that maskh could not occur thereafter. Whereas others just said this is all metaphorical because a donkey is is considered to be abladul hayawanat. It's, it's you know the the, the donkey is um, it's it, you know it 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 appears as a very dumb creature, right? Uh, it's very docile and it doesn't do anything, right? You just stand there like a very you know um, uh, you know like a foolish creature in essence. So the idea is like. You know, um, you know, Allah will make this person like, like a himar, like a donkey, because the, because a donkey cannot hear. It's not in, it's not intelligent. It cannot hear. If you tell it something, it won't understand you. So that's what the hadith is trying to say. If you if you take that understanding, i.e., that you know, um, if if you behave in that way, you're just like a donkey. You're not listening to the advice of the Prophet You're not adhering to his law. Okay, you're not following his way. Or we can take it literally, as we said, and then, you know, uh, this is a warning that this is something that might potentially happen. Um, and uh, so, and the other version, like, what will, what, you know, what will protect you if you were to raise your head before the Imam that that Allah can turn your head into the, 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 the head of a dog, right? Um, so, uh, it's a different version another one that says that the one who raises his head before the imam then his forelock is in the hands of the devil indicating that he has no respect in following the imam and uh, and in, in following the, the congregation Wallahu alam. Um, so that concludes that chapter and I think we will conclude therefore today as well inshallah um, we'll open up the floor for if there are any final questions or comments inshallah I sometimes delay standing up after the second sujood only out of fear of hitting someone behind me. <laughs> right, uh, it happens more often than not due to uh, due to my height. Not due to my yeah. I, I appreciate that. No, if it's yeah, if you do that just to prevent yourself from harming someone else or prevent harming your own self, that's okay. Inshallah, or we'll hit your mimbar on the head. Okay, I see. <laughs> they installed the uh, that foam there to protect the heads there, which is uh, which has helped. Unless you're Right in the corner. <clears throat> okay, I answered that question by wiping the face after the door. Yeah.
I'm well, alhamdulillah. Jazakum la khairan for asking. Alhamdulillah. The day went quite quick today. So, uh, alhamdulillah. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Controversial question incoming. <laughs> right. I'm just about to leave. Okay. We'll... Uh, see how controversial it is then uh, we might need to make a quick exit <laughs> or was that a co was that a comment in in response to uh Atif's comment about how I'm doing today We'll see, inshallah. So I remember there's a slight 20 minute, 20 second delay. Yeah, I can actually change the the settings on um, YouTube such that there's a shorter de shorter delay. Uh, I just didn't want to compromise on uh, streaming quality. That was the only issue. All right. Okay. All right. So I, I thought Bilal was okay. Sorry, I thought Bilal was going to ask a question. Um, is there any okay question on telegram is there any similar reward for women praying at home and having angels participate in the prayer um i don't know of anything explicit right uh, i mean the hadith do mention like when the imam says you know uh, i mean right and rabbana lak alhamd you know etc um but uh, I think we should all assume that uh, that your that your salah, right? It, it is witnessed by the angels, right? Uh, that your salah is definitely witnessed by the angels. So, inshallah, even the angels that are writing down your good deeds, they are seeing that as well, and they potentially are praying for you as well, inshallah. Um, uh, there's an opinion that Sa'atul Istijaba Sa'atul Istijaba is from when the Imam goes on top of the mimbar to give the khutbah and at the end of the jama'ah right yes and also there's another opinion that states in between the two khutbahs as well right in between the two khutbahs so what about making dua when the Imam makes dua so that's slightly different because you know like for, for example um in 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 uh, um, now traditionally you find when it comes to the khutbah, right? When it comes to the khutbah, we do many things, right? That technically, right, is not reported. The person would do regularly, like you know, like the way everyone makes dua at the end of uh, Juma. Ah. Yeah, it's it's like a standard feature you find everywhere. At the end of the khutbah, there's a lots of dua. Where is this from the Sunnah, right? I'm not saying it's wrong, but you know, if people insist like you need evidence to do this, like make dua and things like that at particular times, right? It's it's not known, like you know, and that's why even in the books of fiqh, right, it doesn't say like you know, um, specifically, right? You you know, it's a specific Sunnah to make dua at the end of the khutbah, even the way the khutbah would begin, 
right? Like, you know, th there's nothing specifically mentioned that the Prophet would begin his khutbah in a, in a, in a, in a standard way. Like, khutbatul haja, inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa still. That's specific to, this was known for, for marriage khutbahs, right? And you don't find the fuqaha ever saying it's recommended to start off the khutbah with that, right? Uh, with the khutbatul haja, right? Um, but you can if you want to, but to do it like consistently, insistently that every, that's the sunnah to do that. This is actually, um, you, you don't find many of the, anyone from the Salaf actually say that, right? So the, going back to the question though, um, so yeah, I mean, when, when would you make the dua then? This is a good question, like, you know. You can make the du'a if you follow that view. Ibn Qayyim speaks about this in Zad al-Mahad. I think someone uh, mentioned that. Yeah, there was a long... Yeah, in the Zad al-Mahad class, we... we, we, uh, we this is actually when we were covering Riyadh al-Salihin. When, we when we covered the section of Salat al-Jumu'ah, right? Um, or or Jumu'ah itself, we read from a, a fascinating section from Zad al-Mahad about the the khasa'is, the special features of Jumu'ah. I have it as the, as Abdurrahman mentioned on SoundCloud as a special playlist. It's a special playlist on uh, SoundCloud relating to Jumu'ah. It's about five lessons, I think. So listen to that, inshallah. Hopefully that will give more clarity on that issue, inshallah. Uh, when the Imam says Allahu Akbar, is it before or after he has moved? The Imam should say Allahu Akbar, right, um, during the transition. So us women cannot see the Imam. So how do we know if we have proceeded? Meaning, just leave it like a like a literally a second after he said Allahu Akbar, and that should be enough, inshallah. Yeah. Um, my question was about your views on Mutawif and the Hajj booking. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a sad reality what's happening. Um, you know, I, I find it odd that they didn't give any sort of official warning to the travel agencies around the world. Or, you know, in the, in the Euro European countries, anyway, English speaking countries. It's very odd. Right? It doesn't seem right. Um, but I don't like passing judgment on anything until I have the full picture, right? And at the moment, I don't have a full picture. I only have snippets of what people have done and, you know, show I've seen some screenshots and what have you. What I can say is very upsetting and sad, saddening. But, yeah, I mean, what else can I say? <laughs> you know, what else can I say? Um, Allah Yeah, that's a good. In Jumma's khutbah, they still pray for the Abbasid Khalif. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there are some really old khutbahs that people preserve, especially in the Asian community, because they read from the the uh, the Jumma collections, the the books that they write. Yeah. Okay, inshallah, jazakumullah khairan everybody, and inshallah, shall see you next week. Inshallah, subhanaka wa bihamdika, shalom la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubi ilaikum, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.